Luke 15, beginning at verse 11, is where our story begins tonight. And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth with, between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything to eat. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. He said to him, Your brother's come, and your father's killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in, but his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered him and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, his son, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes and killed the fat cat, you have killed the fat cat for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. Let's pray. Father, help us to learn to celebrate when the lost come. When they come to know you and come to trust you and become a part of our family. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't be like this brother. Father, help us to learn to, to celebrate with you and to seek your presence and, and your love and your peace. We pray to ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this has been called the parable of the prodigal son. And perhaps one of the best loved stories of our, of our Lord's stories that he told. We often neglect, though, the plight of the elder brother when we tell this story. This elder brother who complained that though his father had made a feast for his black sheep, prodigal son, he himself had never even gotten a, a kid young goat in order to make merry with his friends to have a party and the father's answer is kind of interesting here son you're always with me and all that I have is yours I think if we're honest many of us might be suffering from what we could call the elder brother syndrome the elder son syndrome notice first of all tonight the high privilege of children of the children of God Verse 31 contains two very rich privileges for Christians. First, we see this unbroken fellowship that we have with the Father. He said, Son, you are always with me. God is always near us. We can dwell every hour of our lives in the presence of, of our Heavenly Father through His Spirit. In the Old Testament, Enoch and Noah walked with God and God told Jacob, Behold, I am with you, over in Genesis 28, 15. He told Moses, My presence will go with you, in Exodus 33, 14. And God's presence with Israel 
distinguish them from other nations. Our, our Savior promised that He would be with us always and that the Father and the Son will make their abode with us. They'll dwell with us. Uh, Christians should live every moment in fellowship with God. That presence is, is with us wherever we go. You know, we don't have to come to church to find it. We, we can find it at home. We can find it in a closet. We can find it on the street. Uh, in all kinds of trouble, we can have undisturbed rest and peace because God will be with us. The next privilege we see here in verse 31 is unlimited blessings from the Father. Now, you know, we're not talking about some kind of prosperity gospel here. But certainly God blesses us with spiritual blessings. Mm -hmm. The Father said to the older brother, all that I have is yours. All that God has is ours. In, in Matthew 7, 11, Jesus said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? 1 John, or John 1, 16. From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Amen? Haven't you been blessed by God? Ephesians 1.3 says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And isn't that really the, the meaning of the wonderful promises given in connection with prayer? You know, whatever you ask, He will give. Remember that Jesus said in John 15.16, and let's read that. You did not chose, choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And, and, and so there it is. That's the, the life of the children of God as, as he himself has pictured it to us through Christ. This unbroken fellowship and unlimited blessings that we can receive. And again, we're not talking about, you know, push the right button and, and the genie God will, you know, put a million dollars in your bank account. These are spiritual blessings that are much more valuable than a million dollars. Amen. However, we also need to discuss here, secondly, the low experience of too many of us as His children. As I just told you, the life of the children of God, as He Himself has pictured it to us, his unbroken fellowship and unlimited blessings. However, the, the older brother in this story enjoyed neither of those. Not the fellowship or the blessings. The, the elder son had served his father lo these many years, yet he complained that his father hadn't given him this, this young goat, this kid. Uh, and and he, though the, the, the prodigal received the fat and calf in, the, in this experience, and, you know, the truth is, his father had given him everything. He just had never enjoyed it. And probably because he was thinking about trying to enjoy it in the wrong way. You know, having this, you know, how much better was he than, than his brother who went and partied off, you know, somewhere. He really wanted to go off and party with his, his buddies. You know, have this feast. I don't see that he was a whole lot better than his brother who'd run off. Uh, and isn't that really true of, of many believers? So let, let me ask this question. How does God deal with lost sinners? Well, He focuses His attention on them. He pours His love on them. He waits patiently for them to come to their senses, you know, to, to repent of their sins, come, come to Him as children. God has, has centered His whole plan for creation on, on this one expectation that sinners will see the error of their ways, will see their sin, turn back to Him so that He can bring to fruition His plan of salvation and redemption through Christ. When a sinner repents and, and becomes a part of God's kingdom mission, what do you think happens in heaven? It's a party, a real party, a real celebration. And... and you know, that's what we want to see is party time in heaven and party time here, but a good kind of party time, not, not a, you know, a, a party filled with sin, but a party filled with joy and peace and love and peace and, and mercy. It, it's, it's, 
uh, the way that we need to celebrate in the way that you really, it's really the only true celebration. But sadly, it doesn't always work that way here on earth. We're, we're just too busy establishing our in-groups. We're trying to define who's in the out-group that we keep out, you know. Uh, we're afraid to, to smear our reputation or to be seen with people who just don't belong. They don't measure up to our standard. Somehow we always classify ourselves as God's people, you know, saved people. Even though a, a quick look at God's Word shows that we often don't really act like God's people. Uh, or, or at least we don't act like the way He tells people to act if they're going to be His. We may be fooling ourselves sometimes into thinking that God has joy in us. So in other words, I'm suggesting we need to ask ourselves some questions tonight. Am I a grouchy old brother like this guy, you know? Refusing reconciliation and upset at these imagined slights of the Father. Am I lost? Do I need to repent? Can I bring wondrous joy to heaven in my relationship with, with the Father? What then is thirdly tonight the cause for this discrepancy between God's gifts and our low experience? Well, why this discrepancy in the older brother's life? Simply because not believing he would get this goat, you know, this, this time to party. He lived in this kind of constant murmuring and constant dissatisfaction. The elder son thought that he was serving his father faithfully, staying there in his father's house, but it was, it was really in the spirit of bondage, rather in a spirit of freedom. Not in the spirit of a child, so that so much so that his unbelief blinded him to the conception of his father's love and kindness and, and the blessings his father really wanted to bestow on him. He, he was unable at all times to see that his father was ready not only to give him a kid, but a hundred or a thousand, or you know, he said, You've got all, you have it all. All everything I have is yours. In West Texas, there's a famous oil field. It's known as the Yates Pool. There's a picture of it. <clears throat> During the Depression, this field was a sheep ranch. It was owned by a man by the name of Yates. Mr. Yates wasn't able to make enough money on his ranching, his sheep ranching, to, to pay the principal and interest on the mortgage. So he was in danger of losing his, his property and with very little money for food or clothes his family like many others in those days had to live on government subsidies you know uh, I don't know if you've ever had commodities anybody ever eat commodities in your life a few of us have you know generic peanut butter comes in a can oh yes <laughs> powdered milk yeah that's what Mr. Yates was living on. And day after day, as he grazed his sheep over those rolling West Texas hills, he was no doubt greatly troubled, very upset about how, how am I going to pay, pay the next bill? You know, how am I going to make it and get by? And then a seismographic crew from an oil company came into the area, and they did some, some readings on his property, and, and they told him there might be oil on his land, and asked him permission to drill a wildcat well. And so he signed the lease. At 115, at 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve, giving 80,000 barrels of oil a day. In fact, 30 years after they made this first discovery, there was a government test on one of his wells, and it showed that it could still flow 125,000 barrels of oil a day. And Mr. Yates owned all of it. The day he purchased the land, he received the oil and mineral rights. And yet, he was living on relief, eating commodities. A multimillionaire living in poverty. What was the problem? Well, he didn't know there was oil there. He owned it, but he didn't possess it. That's really like a lot of Christians today. We, we, we don't realize how rich we are in Christ and the blessings that we can receive if we just 
reach out and take them. If our experience is similar, it's because of unbelief in the love and the power of God. And unbelief made the, the wilderness experience a wilderness experience for the Israelites and for many of us. Uh, if we really believed in the infinite love of God and His, His power and His promises, I think that would make a big change. Don't you? Don't you? Let's talk fourthly here about the way to restoration. This younger son came to himself, right? He kind of woke up there in the pigsty and, and came to his senses, turned his steps towards home. And isn't that really the first step? To turn towards home, to turn towards God. For those who've been living uh, in the Father's house, but not trusting His love and enjoying His presence and claiming His promises, we need to turn really towards home, towards God. The Father says to us, you must repent and believe that I love you and that I am always with you and that all I have is yours. I read a story about a rabbi who was teaching his students and it, it kind of made me think about this message. The rabbi was Ben Jokai. He was teaching a group of students about the miracle of the manna uh, when Israel was on the way from Egypt to the Promised Land. And, and one of the students asked why the Lord didn't furnish enough manna you know, for Israel at one time that would last the whole year. And the teacher said, well, let me answer you with this parable. He said, once there was a rich man who had a son to whom he promised an annual allowance. And every year on the same day, he would give his son the entire amount. And, after a while, it began to happen that the only time the father would see his son would be when he was giving him his allowance on payday. Only time he saw him. So the father decided this is not a good plan. He changed his plan and only gave the son enough for a day. Each day. Then the next day, the son would return for his allowance for the day. And from then on, the father saw his son every day. And that's the way God deals with Israel. When he gives out the manna, except on the weekend, he gave, gave him enough for the weekend. And that's the way he deals with us. Let me just say this, that there are many Christians who, they're not living off in a far off country. You know, they're not running around in sin. Uh, they're, they're trying to live for God. But as Grandma used to say, they're as poor as Job's turkey. Why? Well, they're, they're blessed with all spiritual blessings, but they don't take advantage of any of them. God says, it's all yours. Everything that I have belongs to you. It's yours. Take it. Our Heavenly Father is rich in spiritual blessings. Again, we're not talking about prosperity. We're talking about being blessed spiritually in, in the way that really counts. And they all belong to us, but he's not going to force those on us. You know, he, we need to reach out and take them for ourselves. And, and as our story closes, it looks like the elder son is still out of fellowship with his father. The, the father, however, has left the door to fellowship open. And, and open wide, just like he did for the, the other son who ran off to the far country. Years ago, there was a, a preacher, Dr. Chadwick. He, he made the statement that there's a third son in this parable of the prodigal son. He said the younger son broke the father's heart. The elder son was out of fellowship. And the third son is the one who told the parable. He is Jesus Christ, the son of God. He's... He's the ideal son without sin. He came to a far country not to run away, but to do the will of the Father. He didn't spend his life in riotous living, but in sacrificial living. And he wasn't a prodigal son, but a prince of peace who shed his blood for the sins of the world. He, he wasn't a wayward son, but a willing sacrifice. He says... But as many as receive him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Salvation comes to any who simply believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Anyone. 
If, if you're the son who went away to a far country, you can come back to the father by confessing your sins. Perhaps you're like the older son. You've, you know, he was out of fellowship, but you know, he was still there. He, he had no concern or love for his brother. He, he thought he was serving his, you know, serving his father, serving God in a sense. Uh, he never transgressed like his brother did, you know. I think there's a lot of church people who, who think that, you know, I've served God all my life, and, you know, I haven't sinned like some of these other people out around here, but, but yet they're still out of fellowship with God and not really living the way God wants them to. The Father says, all I have is yours, and, and how wonderful it is for us to have a Father like this. If anyone who's never trusted Christ as their Savior is not, obviously, the, the son or daughter of the Father, but you can become by just putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died for you. And then when you accept Christ as your Savior, God becomes your Father and He'll, He'll never throw you overboard. He'll never uh, cast you aside. And if, if you leave Him and one day return, He'll be there just like this Father, arms wide open, ready to welcome you back into the family. How wonderful God is. Many children of God as I said, are like this elder brother. They, they need to confess that though they're his children, they aren't really willing for God to fill their hearts all day long with his blessed presence and, and to fill their lives with his blessings. Uh, I pray that, that God will convict us of our cold hearts, of our, of our way of living apart from him and not in his presence and not receiving the blessings he so desires to give to us. If we'll just open our lives to him. We're going to sing uh, a final song that talks about a fountain. Uh, there's a fountain filled with blood. And, it, and it's about those blessings, that spiritual blessing that God wants to give us, his, his presence in Christ. Let's stand and commit to him tonight as we sing this song. There is a fountain.